We have less than a month of summer left, but the temperatures are still crazy. I was looking at my plants a couple of weeks ago, just doing a survey on their health. We had several terrible 40 degree days, but I've sort of prepared for it a while ago by adding some shade cloth, as you can see. But due to budget constraints, I didn't completely cover everything, and because of that, some of my plants got sunburned. In this episode, I'll be walking you through them, and hopefully you'll see the importance of preparation. Of course, not all is lost. The clips that you saw earlier are from a few weeks ago. 
sometime during early or mid January and that's the hottest part of summer. A lot of time has passed since then so there's been some improvements. I think now is a good time to walk you through it. So let's go. For garden reviews I think I'd like to do it in the first person because so I miss having this point of view. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you would know that in my earlier videos, I used to be filming exclusively with my phone, handheld, and right now I'm actually using my DSLR, handheld. It's not as easy as just holding my phone and just waving it around, but I'm getting used to it. I'm wondering how we should do this. Maybe we could go through each landscape one by one, and see where we go from there. That might work. I am thinking that we could start with this section first because this mound has a different setup compared to the others and I think it would be easier to go over them if we treat them as one bunch so if the plants that I put in here work together one of the first things I've noticed right off of the bat is that as you can see I've got a bunch of freedoms here one of them is planted directly in the ground while others are inside pots well this one is not a freely. And this one is supposed to be carunculated, but it's it's being a bit smooth right now. It happens, it reverts, and it reverts to the smooth form and just goes back to carunculated later on. It's an annual cycle. Again, before I start droning on and on and on again, one of the first things I noticed is that this curls is growing a new pup. So you might remember many episodes back that I pulled a bunch of pops underneath. For some reason, it's it's pushing out one just beneath the just beneath this flower stalk. As I mentioned just now, this embossed gem right here has reverted to to having smooth leaves. Although if you look at the older leaves at the bottom, they have the caruncles. But if you look closer though, the, the new leaves at the top, they have the caruncles growing. I've only had this for a year, so I'll have to check on it every year and see when exactly the, the bumps go, go away and when they come back. I have a feeling that it has a tendency to go smooth during the growing season. Once it goes dormant again, it grows all of those bumps. Well, it does seem to coincide with those seasons. This one is a big red, it has lots of flower stalks coming out and this stalk in particular as you can see has many branches and what I find really weird about this is some of the tips don't have flower buds so it might be actually growing pups, we'll see. This freely on the left, this large green one over here, this is an Echeveria blandi. As you can see, I pulled out most of the leaves on this stalk, pushed a new flower stalk here, and here's another opportunity for... And this is another opportunity for leaf propagation. Two things I notice about this. The first one is, if you look underneath the skirt, it's growing some aerial roots. I'm not sure what it's trying to tell me. Are its roots rotten? Doesn't seem like it because the plant, is, the plant itself is pretty. Because if the stem below was rotten, then it should have already started bending over, falling over. The main stem feels firm. So I think it's just one of those random aerial roots. But in any case, just to be absolutely sure, I'll just pull it out and have a look just in case there's something wrong with it besides it pays to be sure especially since they're going to be dormant in several months from now i mentioned noticing two things and the other thing that i noticed was that the leaves that i plucked from this blondie they're now all starting to root pretty unusual for for a frilly but maybe i'm now working off 
on the hypothesis that maybe the green frillies are more likely to root from leaves compared to the others although it might just be a coincidence so we'll see this pale one over here this is an Echeveria Domingo I've recently cut off the larger flower stalk because it was, it was just messing around with this large one over here it's trying to push out another flower stalk though and you know what I do about flower stalks anyway I pull out the leaves another opportunity for propagation but anyway the plant itself has compared to the others in this area this one has stayed relatively compact relatively flat the stem doesn't seem to be growing too too quickly unlike the others here I think this may have to do with the density of the rosette as you can see compared to the large freely ones this one has significantly more leaves compared to the others and if you look closely on the stem the, the, the other types each leaf node occupies a huge part of the stem in terms of the height so since this ones this ones have tighter and denser rosettes each node is just tiny so I guess compared to the others this one that's what makes this one grow tall at a shorter rate this next one is an Echeveria pastel might have gotten its name from the colors that it can go right now it's a bit pale but when it gets colder you'll see this one has a very nice light purplish pink tinge sometimes it goes orange really amazing colors man like some of the other frillies here it's starting to go leggy but I'm not yet sure if I'm willing to chop it up now I'm giving myself until March to decide whether I should chop them or not because that should be that should still be enough time for them to grow and over here at the edge this bright green one here is a Echeveria pallida it has several pops around the stem so I might I might have to separate them soon why wait hmm this is cool apparently my palida has already fallen over due to the sheer weight of the head but but based on the direction that it's growing right now it looks like the head is twisted itself so it can still grow upwards so essentially right now what it's doing is it's crawling so this definitely has to be beheaded i'll be leaving the pups alone for now because i'll be working on chopping this together with the rest i just have to figure out where to put them for the meantime i still have no idea what this one is but it's getting leggy so i might have to do something about that soon now here's something you might not have noticed yet but this is one thing i did recently and i haven't put up the video for it yet but as you can see the large bowls in this design are now properly surrounded by echeveria violet queens i've propagated enough of them that i could completely fill the lining and you could also see in the middle bowl around the middle bowl the blue chalk sticks these are the senecio serpents they have already completely filled up the area they're providing a nice contrast against the earthy colors of the terracotta bowls of course we'll never overlook the embricata around this area although you might notice a couple of gaps here i pulled out two embricatas that were starting to rot and i might have to readjust the remaining ones just shift them around so they fill up the gaps evenly besides some of them are getting too big so they might need a bit of space otherwise they might be a bit stunted if you look at them closely this one is this one is oriented properly it's upright so is this one but that one has gotten too big that it's starting to push itself out so it's facing outwards this is why i need to give them a bit more space that way this one will be growing more happily this is an echeveria capri that went terminal a while back there are some bare spots around because I picked, I plucked a few pups and sold them. I might have to remove the rest of them soon and have them grow their own roots. Because right now they're, they're all etiolated. 
and now you get to see this big mess which is my sedum and ground cover area so you can see I have a huge bowl right here a huge white bowl and inside is a mini landscape of sorts it has its own rocks and a bunch of other plants just surrounding the whole thing well not not surrounding but planted inside the whole thing and around the bowl you'll see a bunch of different types of ground cover this is a mix of sedums, sedivarias, uh, senecios, mesembs I guess all sorts of stuff and at the far end you'll see blue chalk sticks and silver pig's ears if you also have a closer look on the, the mound created above the bowls the pearls here are doing really well they are much larger than the than the rest of the pearls that I have in my collection they're really huge man and the thing is they are exposed to the sun more exposed than the others I have in the other landscape so it's odd it's even spilling downwards towards the, the ground you know I'm not kidding when I say I went crazy with the plants here I think I just stuck several types without without really thinking about the design <laughs> and look at them all now they've overgrown they've thrived and they have filled up the area this is great though because at least this means that I have a place where I can harvest my own plants you know use them in other landscapes so I guess this this could be my buffer area if I'm not sure where I want to put them then I just plant them here and now the aeonium patch as you can see this is this area has been cleared out recently and you might remember this in one of the latest episodes there's a lot of space and I've already discussed my plans to move this sunburst put it on top with the view that I just got an aeonium cyclops I might have to do things a bit differently so what I was thinking was that instead of having the starburst in the middle maybe I could move it maybe I could move it to the left so the sunburst would be on the top the starburst would be the, the, the level below it's already big anyway and at the far end over there that's where I could put my cyclops another large cultivar so the idea is let me just shift back here the idea is the, the green and yellow ones would be over here while the dark brown and red ones would be to the right I think that would make a good transition but nothing is set in stone right now I have to think about it and I can't wait until March so I can start working on it and now we're looking at the arc as you can see the plants here are doing okay except for the bits where it has burnt in the earlier part of the video this is what you see there are some burnt plants over here just a small strip and this is due to the lack of covering on this side but otherwise the rest of the area is doing fine so I'll just have to leave them as is you know let them continue doing what they're doing let them do their thing because they're filling up the place nicely a uh, really good indicator for that are the sedums right here in front they haven't dried out and sedums are quick to dry out so yep they're doing good just like on the big red the flowers on this echeveria double delight seem to be acting weird because on the tips of some of them there aren't any flower buds so there might be actually some pups growing so this is another thing that i'll be checking on the months and weeks to come we're at the area behind the arc and at the far right side and as you can see there are a few imbricatas here in the ground one of them is starting one of them has a bit of rot as you can see I've already pulled out the leaves I think to be safe I'll just have to pull out the entire plant and maybe and maybe restructure the imbricatas and of course all this work here depends on how I re eventually restructure the aeoniums so it will be a while before I do anything in this area my Echeveria Glocas stream is doing really well there are still a few gaps as you can see right here but they have filled up the area really nicely there are also a few gaps at the top surrounding the bowl so I might have to work on that I'm still thinking of what I want to do here but 
maybe I'll be doing this based on texture so maybe a bit more ground cover see what textures and colors I can work with and fill it up and this is the far right side of this little mound as you can see I have I have some imbricatas here but these are the pale versions of the imbricata and I'm trying to make more of these these pale ones are different from the ones on the other side that you saw just now they change significantly across seasons especially during the colder months they go a lovely orange pink and red during winter I want to make more of them and replace eventually replace that, the ones on the other side so I'll just have to stay on track with my propagations and eventually replace all of them this pot contains a, a cluster of Echeveria imbricata all of these pups are growing from a single stem and this is actually uh, an imbricata that has it has gone terminal terminal inflorescence as you can see there's no there's no visible stem at the middle now the pups have completely covered it I haven't really thought about what I want to do with them yet so I just leave them as is until I guess the, the main stem dries out even more they look pretty cute in this clump though project lux my what a difference a growing season makes I think the most obvious change I made here was that I changed I switched the, the Echeveria Black Knight that used to sit in this bowl with the afterglow and I think I made the right choice because this one looks really striking and it's a real eye catcher I'm happy with my decision here as for all of the plants at the back as you can see they all just went up in size it's really crazy man I am contemplating removing some of them and transferring them in, uh, in the new landscape that I'm working on because at the rate that they're growing right now there would be little space for them to move or to grow into if I leave them like this my freelies and bumpy ones in particular are trying to get a, uh, as much space as they can and this might be a problem come autumn and winter when they start laying their leaves flat so this is something I have to think about during autumn my agavoides are doing okay that's my Romeo in the middle right now it's not as red as it was last time because it has been consistently warm but come autumn and winter it, the colors will be striking again and you'll see you'll see more photos of it again by then as far as the others are concerned I've already picked up I already plucked most of their pups although they're still trying to pull, push out a few more and I'll just be ready for them the last time I showed you this area the elegants have completely filled up the arc but as you can see they're closed they're shut tight at the moment so that means that you can see the gaps in between I'm not really concerned about this because when it gets colder again the leaves will lay flat you won't be able to see the ground again I'm looking forward to that this is the pop on the Mauna Loa flower stalk which is confusing me and to date it still hasn't grown any flower buds in the center so I am getting really hopeful that it is actually a pop and this is nice because it's growing pretty, pretty huge this is even larger than the size that I got the parent when I first bought it last year no two years ago so yep pretty exciting and so overall the plants at project Lux are all doing really well especially the larger types and as you can see they are all putting out some flower stalks they're doing this in time for autumn this is the area at the back which I call my area of neglect <laughs> and it is literally neglected as you can see there's a I'm not sure what this is is this a pumpkin or I think this is a pumpkin pumpkin patch so the pumpkin vine is trying to take over the area well you'll have your day you know what I think these vines are trying to reach each other they're almost touching maybe a few more days yeah maybe give them a few more days of growth and they would reach all the way we have a bunch of imbricata in the ground and they're pushing out more pups so I might have to go on another pup harvesting session soon speaking of imbricata pups the ones I harvested before are now doing great they have recovered from the sun damage and they are starting to grow even larger and to be honest I actually sold a few of them already so you can see gaps here 
the ones that I planted in the alcove are doing much better than the ones at the back. As you can see, they're bright green and they're curled upwards. This means that they're getting enough light to keep them compact, but not enough light to stress them too much. So these ones are growing much faster than the ones that are fully exposed. This one might look familiar. These are the blue chalk sticks and the pig's ears that I pulled out. And I was cleaning out the aeonium section. As you can see, this is a whole wheelbarrow full and I'm trying to get rid of them. If you happen to be in Melbourne, I'm selling the whole thing, well, the contents, not the wheelbarrow. I'm selling the contents for $30. So if you're interested, this is, this is only for pickup because it would be too expensive to send them via post. And now it's time for the front. I don't always show you the front because I do most of my work at the back. Here's the area in the front where I have succulents growing. As you can see, it's a mixture of campfire, uh, Sidum Autumn Joy, some Kalanchoe Sexangularis, some Flapjacks, Graptosidum Francesco Baldi, it's an Agave Pari Truncata. The ones below are Chiveria Secunda Gloca. Of course, a bunch of Imbricatas the whole, lining up the whole place. And as borders, we have the blue chalk sticks. Behind the blue chalk sticks are Aeonium Velours, Aeonium Atropurpureums, and Tradiscantia Palida. I think I also have an Aeonium Zwartkop somewhere. And on the reverse side, we have, we have the whole thing lined up by Silver Waves. These are the curly version of the Silver Pig's Ear. So as you can see, the texture that they provide makes a very good contrast against the rest of the plants. And as you go more towards the center, you can see more Aeoniums here. These are a bunch of Atroporperiums and there's a Velour mix in here somewhere. And right at, right at the very middle, there's an Agave Americana variegated, surrounded by a low ground cover, some sort of mesembe. And around them, my mother-in-law planted some Aeonium Kiwi. So we have the same theme going on for the rest of the garden. And here's a sneak peek of my propagations. They're doing quite well. A lot of them have rooted. Some of them are already plantlets and I've already used some of them in the landscape. Maybe a bit of a closer look. So some of them are, have already grown quite large. The rest haven't grown much. But for those that did, I've already moved them out. So as you can see, many of the trays here are bare because I've already used them in the landscapes. Some of my propagations have been moved into small pots, individual pots, so they've been growing on their own for a while now. I'm not sure what I want to do with them, but if I can't figure out a way to use them in the landscape, then I might just be selling off most of them. As always, there's lots of things for me to do in the garden. Lots of maintenance work and lots of propagation to do. Summer is ending soon, which means that the Aeonians will be waking up from their dormancy and I can't wait for that. It also means that I have a small window of autumn for any propagation that I want to do. I think I'll take advantage of the opportunity and behead the ones that needs beheading. So, so I think my garden would look funny for the next few weeks while, while things have no heads. So you see, there is a balance here. Gardening is not only always about the good parts, you know? I'm not a perfect gardener by any means, so I also have my fair share of losses and most of them are burns which are basically just negligence on my part because I'm such a lazy bum but I don't really mind because as much as it's a pity losing some of them I don't really mind because the whole thing is a learning experience so it's something, it's a wake up call for me to be less careless about things at least I know what to do next summer and it's time once more for shoutouts. Of course, I can't end this episode without thanking my Patreon supporters. As always, I'd like to thank my loyal supporter, Oscarino. Wait. <gasps> it's not just Oscarino. We also have a shoutout for Julie Seal. Thank you. And Snap Kui. Wow. Well, given that this is a shout-out, I think Nina, or Snap Kui, deserves a Kui. But I don't think my Kui is any good and I might disrupt the neighbor, so 
I'll just provide a link to a kui down below. Wow, three patrons. How cool is that? So if you want to be a patron, just head over to the link. It's, it's patreon.com slash seriescapades. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.